friends, we are in heaven, also known as the Historic Motorsports Association paddock. Good friends from HMSA and also the Vintage Indy Group putting on Vintage Indy Cars sessions this weekend, two races as well, all the glory cars, at least a lot from my era and growing up. So we're gonna do a paddock tour. We don't have all the cars here. Some of them are outside or at other events right now, but let's take a look at the amazing cars. Many of these have great histories here at the Long Beach Grand Prix. Starting off with, this was Oriel Servia's car, the KV Racing Team, the final ever champ car race. That being held here 2008, this Panos DP01 chassis. Our guy Oriel finished fifth. We're hopefully gonna grab him in the next day or two and do a little video, talk about the car, do some reminiscing. This thing, just about as beautiful as it can be, also has some of the crew and the mechanics who ran the car back in 2008 here looking after it. So that part's amazing. You wanna talk about beauty, just pure beauty. 1991 Lola Chevrolet powered Jim Hall Racing. You look at the name on the side of the cockpit, that is John Ann Dreddy. This was his win, his one win in IndyCar, 1991 Surfer's Paradise. Don't wanna reveal too much of my age, but I will tell you that I still have that race. I think it aired on ESPN on videotape, having recorded it, uh, I think I was, I don't remember where I was in 91, but just pure glory how beautiful this car is. The Hall and Vander Stratton, Rudy Van, VDS racing side, this machine just truly amazing. And then we have Not My Brother, who I love. We have the old issue of On Track here, Scott Pruitt, this Lola, this from this 95, 96 era of Firestone coming back into IndyCar racing. Most famous victory for Scott with them with this the Michigan 500. Again, you look at this 95 Lola, you just you step back and look at it from the side and look at the full expanse of the car from nose to tail and how low it is. Today's cars are low as well, but you just get a great appreciation for how low slung the vehicles were, how sleek they were, and it's certainly a beauty from Patrick Racing. Move down the line, and again, there are a couple of empty slots here, but that's just further reason to be here. Come and see all of this. We have two McLarens here, just, I should say one McLaren, just truly glorious here. Pretty strong similarity looks wise next to it with the Penske, but we have glorious car here and it's Budweiser livery. Next to it, we have the Cam 2 sponsored Penske you do again see some similarities between the two cars. Funny how, although they're a couple years apart, uh, colors are, <laughs> it seems like they're working from the same box of crayons, but also a lot of similarities. You look at the rear wings, again, a lot of designs back then were similar iterations from one car to the next. Front wings even, another great place of interest to look at here between the Penske adjustable front wings, but you look at the notching at the trailing, the outer edge here on the Penske, and what do you see right next door on the McLaren? Well, you see the same exact clearance and notching right there. A lot of, uh, a lot of similar ideas going on here. Rocker arm front suspension, you can see this being polished perfectly with the dampers on the inboard inside there. The front links there connecting the anti-roll bars. The oldest car here, 1966 Eagle, owned by our good friend Rob Dyson. This is going to be driven by another good friend, Stefan Johansson. This car being designed and manufactured about 30 minutes down the road in Santa Ana, California by All-American Racers, Dan Gurney's team, this vehicle, and you see the tribute sticker to the Big Eagle there on the car. 
spent some time yesterday, a couple hours at All-American Racers with Justin Gurney looking at some projects going on there. But this car with its Ford V8, with the hot exhaust setup, that being exhaust in the center of the V, the hot V arrangement, coating, of course, the red here, which is beautiful. And if you want to look at the real stamp of authenticity, you look at the badge here. This coming out of the great state of Michigan, Detroit. When you see any of these old vintage cars like this with a bundle of snake exhaust, you want to know, is this real or is this a reproduction? You look for the plaque there that's welded on on both sides and it tells you that those are indeed original. We're talking more royalty among vehicles. Behind we have an Eagle as well, this being a, a tribute, not the original, but it's a reproduction. I shouldn't say reproduction, this is an actual Eagle, but this is meant to uh, pay tribute to the late Swede Savage. It's another great, great vehicle, not only from its design and success standpoint, but also with its restoration, uh, just flawless once again with a <laughs> earth rattling, earthquake causing Offenhauser turbocharged four cylinder motor. Oh, yeah, <laughs> we are talking about speeds that humans probably were not meant to experience. Take a look here, coming back more towards the early 70s. McLaren, oh boy, Gatorade. Johnny Rutherford, does it get any better? I believe the answer to that question is absolutely not. It is so beautiful and so amazing. Truly, just one of many iconic cars here. The M16 McLarens, oh boy, everything about them, so beautiful. I love just little items like this. We don't want the exhaust, which runs very close here to the engine cover, to burn the engine cover. So what do you do? You come up with some heat shielding, but everything done perfectly, polished. Aerodynamic rivets in place to minimize turbulence going over. Another fun part here as well, because this was not totally part of the time with everybody doing this, but actual side pods. It's tiny not like the full length ones that we see on today's car, or the ones afterwards, but in this little small pod, feeding air into the radiators, one on one side to cool the water heading to the engine, the other side to cool the oil. Also, again, you look at how low this is. This thing is just such a low slung beauty chassis, barely a foot high uh, in some places. Then we get towards the end of our tour. And again, thoroughly encourage you to watch for more of this on Racer and social media and wherever else. Mario Andretti's 1985 Long Beach winning Lola. Newman Haas entered car. This is owned by our friend Scott Borchetta. He's the owner of Big Machine Records, also the promoter of the Nashville IndyCar race, among the many other things that Scott does, but this car is a true pride within his collection. He'll be driving it this weekend. We're hoping to do a dedicated tour of this car with Scott. If you look at the size of the side pods here on this Lola compared to the McLaren that we just looked at, and you get a proper understanding that yes, indeed, we are going to make use of the full width, full length side of the car beneath the side pods as well to generate downforce. Just so beautiful, this 85 Long Beach winner. And uh, we look, what, 21 years later, right next to it, and we have another Newman Haas racing car, this being Sebastian Bourdais. It's actually a 2005 Lola, but used this to win here at Long Beach in 2006 and win the championship in 2006. 
yet again meant to meet up with our guy, Mr. French Fry, Mr. Bourdais, to do a little bit of a walk back through time with this car. And of the many amazing elements about this vehicle and its participation this weekend is the vast majority of the Newman Haas mechanics who ran this car to those victories are here running it this weekend was told that this specific tub this chassis is responsible for seven poles and seven wins so but even more cool to me that we have the real true crew that made all those victories happen here looking after its owner from australia really sweet kid uh, who's going to be giving it his first try here jordan roddy try and get some in-car cameras on this then we get to the end of the tour a lightning that's right the bolts on the car for a reason to describe the chassis name itself ran at the Indy 500 from 1977 through 79 then again from 81 to 83 yeah, it's got a motor in it for sure. <laughs> Big old naturally aspirated V8. Rules back in that era, late 70s, early 80s. Gave a weight break for those who went away from the very popular turbo motors and put in a, again, a stock block style V8. That is exactly what they did here. There were a number of lightnings made. Some of them were quite good still come back to the general premise of if you compare this to some of the McLarens or the Penske's or the whatever's of that era uh, there's a lot of commonalities so instead of truly radical ideas it's a lot of iterations of many of the same comment uh, concepts but let's close here talking about radical and this is indeed what we have 1980 is when this general chassis layout was created. The amazing John Ward doing his first IndyCar designs. By 81, this is where things really took off. The Pepsi Challenger, the yellow color there, Dan Gurney said it was his favorite among all the cars. That AAR design, his favorite Eagle, once again with a naturally aspirated V8 in the back. This is such a radical departure from anything else you'll see. In particular, if you look at the car from the front and you stare back at it, it is a bit like a flying triangle. <laughs> also, you look at the placement of the driver in the car and you see how, I mean, this was state-of-the-art safety back then, so there's nothing critical to say. We just know that time has told us we need to do a little bit more with safety. But if you look here at the pedal box, for example, obviously brake throttle and clutch. Here's your steering column. We also have the rocker arms for the suspension, the damper, the anti-roll bar. The roll bar is adjustable to stiffen. But the part that scares the living daylights out of me, and there were injuries back in the day because a lot of cars were like this, you would climb into the car, take your feet, tuck them under this frame structure, this bulkhead structure right here, tuck them under this, and your feet would pop up here to actuate the pedals. Well, your shins and everything below the knees was basically below this structure here. And in a frontal accident or side or you name it, it was not uncommon for all of that to crumple as it was meant to do but unfortunately uh, legs were part of that crumple zone and yeah so on a lot of cars of this era same exact style layout it wasn't specific just to this eagle but that's something that was a little bit scary but if you look at the car from the side here just thinking once again of the driver and how modern cars have the tub comes up over and around their shoulders you might see the helmet exposed a little bit 
There's composite bodywork that goes over to cover things up, but you do realize if you ever weren't sure how brave drivers were, just realize that everything from about the rib cage up is truly exposed, going 200 plus miles an hour at Indy and the crashes they might have. You think about, you mentioned with feet being exposed, lower extremities, things coming in from the side and easily breaking through that bodywork to get to the driver. There was an acceptance of potential harm, potential risk as well. The last item to mention here, this is an evolution of something that is really big with the 81 Eagle, the BLAT, Boundary Layer Adhesion Theory, BLAT. This is a, a different, this isn't the, the necessarily the curved and tunneled type uh, like we've seen on the 81 car, but this helped make downforce. Got a bunch of vortexes going, pulling down, creating downforce, and you look at the big structure at the back Look at all the bodywork here. Look at all the real estate. And you realize compared to some of the wings that we have seen on cars, this main element sitting up in the wind is not huge, right? It doesn't have this super deep span, super tall cord. It's because so much of the downforce in this really innovative design, you can see the curvature at the bottom piece here. This car is making most of its downforce the bottom of the car pulling all that suction. A lot of it happening at the back, but keep in mind there's also a lever effect that although most of the downforce is being made here, there is a lever effect being placed across this rear axle that actually applies that downforce to the front as well to help the front wings. But radical, as radical gets. Haven't seen an Indy car that I can think of that comes anywhere close to this 1980 through 82-ish evolution of this Eagle. I love everything about it. And yet again, this car being at its home race, half hour away from where it was made. That's our tour of the 2024 HMSA and Vintage Indy paddock. I'm breathless, not because I'm out of breath, but just <sighs> many of these cars are the cars of my youth or the ones that might've come along before I got into racing, but read about exhaustively afterwards. So inspiring, the amazing men and women who made these, conceived these, made them better, tweaked and changed in an era where you could do that in IndyCar. This is everything to me that's about life. So thank you for coming along for the journey. We're gonna have a lot more for you this weekend.